Hello, everybody. Welcome back to MGA. My name is Chris True. I am your host at MC today, coming at you from New Orleans, Louisiana, in the United States of America. I'm excited to be a part of this event. I am really excited to bring up this next presentation. This is a fireside chat from markets to team members all you need to know about expansion. We have Taro Araya and William Balbean, who I'm about to bring to the stage right now and turn the floor over to them. Thank you all so much for being a part of MGS Expand. Please welcome to the stage Taro and William. Hello, hello. Hey, all right, guys. Going? The floor is Thanks all for yours. Having us. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, you, you can uh, really happy to be here. Um, it's uh, it's uh, we're all in different time zones at this point, uh, and uh, but uh, we're we're super excited to uh, to bring to you a, a conversation today uh, around um, what does it actually mean to go cross border. Uh, so uh, as a VC, as a, a you know we're we're SOSB, uh, we invest. Uh, for the last uh, almost 20 years. Uh, and we're very strange, different than other VCs, we invest globally uh, and we're cross-border. So we invest, uh, you know, I invest, our, our six investment partners invest all around the world. Um, so we're investing globally. Uh, and then, so what does that actually mean? It, it, well, it's, it's very hard uh, to build up something in, in one market uh, and then bring it to other markets. Right, uh, and so today, uh, super proud and happy to have uh, my friend and uh, you know a co-conspirator, uh, Taro uh, from Goama Go Games, uh, who's going to uh, shed some insight uh, on um, what does it actually take uh, to go cross-border, um, to uh, start off in in one country in one market and then go to other markets, uh, and then actually uh, you know change hemispheres you know what does it take to go from uh, southeast asia and south asia then and then flip over to latin america south america uh so um i'm not going to really spend a whole lot of time introducing myself but i, I invest in companies um, i'm very proud to have invested in taro and, and, and wayne and the team uh but i'm going to kick it off uh taro could you please introduce yourself thanks william hey, hello to everybody my name is taro i'm, I'm a colombian japanese I'm, I'm calling in from singapore today um, I've been running a company called Guama. We do games. Been doing startups for a while now. Thank you to meet uh, William in my path and, and have him on board. Yeah. So um, I mean, you feel free, Tara, to uh, to ask me some questions. But the the, the first one I'd, I'd, I'd um, like to ask you is, um, you know, so you've been around the block, uh, you know, pre-internet. Uh, what was it like to build up, um, you know, a, a business across some really, really emerging uh, markets? Uh, and uh, you know, you were in mobile, uh, and this is, of course is mobile, but you were on the equipment side. But what was it like in early days to go into Bangladesh, to go into Cambodia, to go into Myanmar or Burma? You know, what what was it like to 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 you know, what was the three things uh, that were perhaps most painful, um, but uh, that you learned the most from? Uh, when you're 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 going into those markets in the in the early days yeah i think i think yeah, a lot of learnings I, I, one is is try not to be too early when you're trying to get into <laughs> and 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 i think timing is is just very important when, when i was going into bangladesh i remember that my initial business plan was entailing and uh, launching a try a tri party way of, uh, of a platform that would use blackberries and then at that moment, it was 2009, 2008, Blackberries was in, in the hype in, in the world, but in Bangladesh, we were, just, we were just scaling up to maybe 50, 60 million uh, subscribers. Yeah. I, I landed in Bangladesh with 2 million subscribers uh, in the whole networks, in the telecom networks. Uh, and there was no understanding of what a smartphone was. There was no understanding what a Blackberry was. And everything, everything in Bangladesh at that moment was candy phones, or the, the yeah, what we call candy phones today. And so, like candy bars. you you really quickly understand and say, hey, how can you 
are, are you are you really gonna put in a uh, a BlackBerry service where you're gonna get calls for free and sponsored by a by a, a brand? And you quickly find out that that's not possible. So you you have yeah. to pivot it really quick and then localize yourself and say, okay, how do you do that? And and actually, the first business I ended up pivoting to at that moment was what we called Facebook on SMS. So it was basically there was prehistoric Facebook times. Nobody knew Facebook. But people wanted to do friends and make friends, so we started. We we launched the service on SMS just to make friends. Awesome, awesome. So you need to the first lesson. You know, you need to match um, the uh, the 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 problem in the market uh, with the product that you're providing. Uh, make sure that they're ready for it, right? Um, and we had the same the same thing with uh, with our Mox platform. So for with Mox, we provide free advertising. Uh, to all the companies that we invest in to help them with uh, for their apps and their services to get user acquisition. Uh, now, how do we get that is we partner uh, mostly with telcos and phone brands and even shopping malls and real estate companies and, and consumer brands. Um, and they, uh, you know, they were uh, in theory hurting for revenue. Right, because big internet is coming in, Google, Facebook, Ali, Tencent, you know, taking all the revenue away. But I went out six, seven years ago with this uh, thing that, uh, oh yeah, your your business is going away. Big internet is going to kill you, Mr. Telco. Big internet is going to kill you, Mr. Phone Brand. Um, and they didn't believe it because those guys were all paying them big money uh, to get installs. Uh, and so we went out to companies like year after year after year for three years to companies like Micromax in India. Uh, and uh, I could talk shit about them because they don't really exist anymore. Uh, but, uh, you know, there were 20% of the smartphone market in India. Um, and then three years, three years, three years, and said, hey, if you promote our Mox apps for free, we'll give you 30% revenue share. Uh, and then you can have a recurring revenue stream just like Xiaomi does in China. Uh, and they said no. Um, but then now, you know, they've gone from a 20% market share to like 0.4% market share or something like that. Uh, so that's, you know, that sometimes the, the, the timing is wrong uh, and I was way too early, uh, but now for Mox, you know, Guam is uh, a, a part of that, but we've gone just in the last two years from 6 million monthly active users to about 100 million plus monthly active users in our ecosystem and all getting uh, those those users for, uh, for free. Um, and when I say free, you know, free advertising, uh, but revenue share back to whoever gave those users. So Taro, I mean, right now, um, so you started off in, in, in Bangladesh uh, and then you you switched the gears, right? You went into, you know, from mobile and, 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 um, and uh, this uh, SMS, you know, Facebook Lite, right? Uh, but uh, you went into the games market and games, you know, is notorious uh, for being A, brutal, uh, B, very clubby, uh, where everybody knows each other. Uh, and, and see, you know, there, there's some people making lots of money and many people making no money, right? So um, uh, as you went in and, and, and you, you know, popped into this market, can you share a little bit about like um, uh, how your business models changed <laughs> over time uh, as the world uh, basically beat you up? Uh, you know, uh, and, you know it's, it's been a fun, long journey with you in, in retrospect, but it wasn't easy on the, on the way through. So can you uh, share a little bit about the pain uh, that uh, you suffered uh, on, the, on the, the early stage of your journey as you, you, know, you, you, you moved from, you know, the, the uh, Facebook for, uh, based on SMS, but then the early days in the 2010s, but over the last five, six years? Yeah, I, I, yeah. I think I think the the so as we as we said, make making sure you're not too early. We started with the Facebook on SMS, Facebook Lite, then and ended up on a call center of health as well, and and learned the the art of the subscription services and yeah, learning the art of subscription services in emerging countries where there is no payment gateways. So you actually piggyback on the telcos and say, okay, how can you offer services based on telco credit? And and that's how we scaled our first businesses. Uh, Facebook and SMS was a friends. A friends chat on SMS and uh, and a um, helpline that we used to serve around 10,000 calls a day and two million SMSs wow. a day. So it was it was and and I think the learning there is you get hooked into the revenue because obviously all, all of a sudden you see the curve going up and that's the curve that all VCs want to see. But yeah. So basically, you're getting you know free user acquisition and you're getting lots of lots of like users and then you're making money 
uh, from the people who are making you know users on, on those games, right? It's basically the old wireless VAS model, right? Yeah. So then you evolve from those SMSs into into gamification, and you and everybody talks gaming, and then the, the traditional thing is how do you how do you actually? We started with a proposition where we didn't have any tech, and we said, well, you know what? Why don't we offer games to our subscribers uh, if everybody wants to play? We see them playing on their on their candy phones. We see them playing on the smartphones. Why don't we offer them games? Oh, by the way, we know subscription. Hey, you know what? Google Play Store iOS are not even available in Bangladesh. We're not available in Myanmar. So why don't we just simply charge the subscription through the telco and offer the unlimited games? We partner up. We we were a good go to market with a part with a Swedish company that we had, and we basically threw a proposition out there of 400 games at a time, and we called it the Netflix of games. Didn't we know? And we learned the hard way is that you get hooked into subscription services. And once you put those propositions out there, well, you start scaling and revenues is incremental. And then usage is the question that you start seeing and say, do you have a platform that you actually use? And we found the hard way that yes, there was a, there was a lot of users with us uh, paying us a subscription, but not the majority of the users were actually using our service. And that was a, that was a big first realization where you actually need to shift gears and you have to disrupt yourself on the, on the business model and say, hey, is really subscription services the right way to go forward? Everybody wants, of course, to have uh, annual recurring revenue or monthly recurring revenue or daily recurring revenue, but in reality, is that the way to do it? And what we found the hard way was that we needed to reinvent ourselves and we shifted gears from a Netflix of games and a B2C proposition to a B2B proposition where we, we, we set up a, a Guama platform, basically allowing our games to be accessed by anybody. Um, and being used as a gamification engine for, for telcos, for digital assets, for super apps. Whereas where we found the other side of the story, now we went to the other side, we, everybody using the service, but then very little people paying for the service. And that's what we have been fixing in the last couple of yeah. months, I guess. Cool, I mean, so um, in, in Asia, in emerging Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia, one of the biggest problems, and, and this used to be big in China, is the telco signs up the user for a bunch of services on a subscription model that they, you know, that the user probably forgets about. The user doesn't even know they have the service; they aren't using it at all, and the telco is just using it to make money. Uh, and uh, and this, and, and and sometimes it's the actual uh, uh, the game company or the the uh, publisher themselves uh, doing this. Uh, but that's not like uh, that's a that's a win win lose and the loser is the user right uh, so um, you know what uh, is very important when you're going into the markets these uh, mobile first mobile only markets so we're not going to talk about uh, in this in this talk about the like U S and Western Europe but we're talking about you know these uh, mobile first um, smartphone heavy markets in India Southeast Asia South Asia Eastern Europe South America Latin America right. And um, the telco, uh, oftentimes you have to really understand what's their motivation, what's their business model, and, and what's the KPI of the person on the other side of the table. Uh, and uh, and you want to make it a win-win-win, a win for the user, a uh, win for your partner, uh, who's hopefully giving you those users, uh, and then a, well, a win for yourself, right? Uh, so, uh, and, and that sounds like really simple and trite, <laughs> but it's not always easy. Uh, especially when you're dealing with like uh, some very very large telco uh, partners, um, so I'd, I'd say that like the 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 uh, the, the next question I kind of want to go. Um, we just talked a little bit about uh, telcos as partners, uh, and uh, you know just making sure that you're aligned uh, with your partners. Uh, what it's what is it like to work with internet companies? So you're coming from sort of like the mobile OG old style, you know, telecom equipment, and then you, uh, into uh, you know wireless fast like and then, and then into you know mobile internet now you know in Netflix of games and now now doing like a, an entire game platform where you're partnering with you know brands and things but what what is it like um, to work with some of your other partners that are actual internet companies you know like internet unicorns and food delivery and other areas uh, these are your new partners and you are um, you know, you're, you're the gaming platform for like Food Panda. Your gaming platform for Rappi. You know, these are these are all unicorn companies. Uh, and, and so, what is it? If if you know, for the audience here, like when you're negotiating with them, um, you know, what what are some tips? Uh, how how is the motivation and the the drive and the the experience different than uh, working with telcos? 
Yeah, I, I think I, 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 would, I would go down to DNAs. Just like when you have kids, yeah. you have two different kids, two different profiles, two different, everything is different. Uh, both are necessary. You need to take care of your two kids. You're not going to like one more than the other. Uh, you might, <laughs> you might be more tolerant with one, but, uh, but both are necessary. And telcos had to have a different speed. I think telco speed is much more um, slower or much more, it, it has a lot of steps in regards to the business model. And, and, and basically you need to understand through the whole chain of command, what yeah. are the KPIs, as we said. When you go into the mobile only or the internet companies, I mean, it's depending on where you hit, it, it's very fast. You can you can have deals. One of my super app unicorns that we closed, we closed a deal in 30 days and we deployed in around 45 from day that we started talking, which is un, unheard or unseen uh, when in the traditional telco side, I would say it would take me between 30 to maybe 150 days to even get to the contract and get it launched. So from that perspective, you have you have to understand on the other side, what is it? The the telcos are, are much more uh, intrinsic in regards to that they have a user that has a piece of hardware on their hand, which is using their, their network. The internet guys don't have anything. I mean, the internet guys have an app, a service, and they need to understand that, how is that service being used? How is that service being engaged? In both cases, we've seen both are necessary. Um, Telcos are the are the mechanism and the service that is giving on digital on the digital front are our super app partners the the payment wallets or the food pandas or the delivery ones uh, they have a service that they need for example from our perspective they need reengagement they need to make sure that they're sticking it um, yeah. and we kind of solve that bring in bring them additional revenue and um, which is it dif it differs on the price session I think. If I were to do, you may you better have in your team, and, and we made sure that in our team, we also have different DNAs to take care of those customers. Um, it's different speed and, and different tolerance on, on on how you have to deal with them. Both are yeah, I, I, both are important. I would say. Yeah, I mean, very simply, you got this uh, Li and Fung, which is one of the biggest uh, clothing and garment manufacturing platforms in the world. Uh, and they work with all the big brands that you heard of in the old days. And then uh, they, they started to do with uh, Amazon. And Amazon's rule of thumb, like what they do is they write the press release and then they negotiate the deal. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> that is actually part of their ethos where they, they write the press release and then they negotiate the deal. And the and fun guys are just like, nah. Uh, not, not going to do it. We can't do it. Uh, but you know, who's going to be left uh, standing? Yeah, definitely Amazon and uh, Lee and Fung is. Uh, you know, they're, they're under some pressure. Um, very, very cool. So, in terms of team, like, you know, I think one of the interesting things uh, about uh, COVID is that people who before did not really embrace uh, distributed remote workforces, um, you know, were kind of forced to. Um, but you guys have been distributed and, um, I don't know, you could, I guess you could say remote, uh, because you're handling you right now. How many countries are you in? We're in uh, almost 30 countries. Yeah. So you're in 30 countries and how many countries do you have people in? 11. Or is it a little hard to track? You don't really track that. Where, where people no, are no, I do. Them. I do. We have, we have people in 11 of those. Okay, so you're hitting, you're you're selling into 30 countries, and, and you know before COVID it was well, it was probably 20 something, right? Or you're almost about 20, 18. Uh, but uh, and then you have people spread across 11, 12 markets. So um, you know, two questions, uh, the same question: uh, What is it like uh, to scale a distributed team, and what is it like to dis scale a distributed, um, you know, uh, a, a customer base, and, and you know. A, to give context here, you don't have a massive team. You're not a huge company. You know, you're 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 a startup, and a lot of people in the audience are probably you know coming from this, uh, or either that or you know they they don't know anything about Myanmar and Bangladesh and Cambodia, and the team that's going to be attacking those markets is probably just that, right? So what 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 has this been like for you? And if you could give um you know a couple uh, lessons, that'd be great. I think the emotional answer would be make sure that you find uh, the right co-founders and or the founding team members that make that that actually put the processes in place and make sure everything works. Yeah. Okay, so how do you do that? <laughs> yeah, that? That's the art of the guy that has to put it together you know, so yourself. So if, if you go back, I think I think the the 
the beauty of this was that before COVID, we were already working distributed. So uh, we were lucky enough to start putting things, systems like Slack, Asana, yeah. uh, having Google Hangouts, having Zoom, having who knows how many things, OKRs, how many tools we have. We have day, weekly check-ins, night check-ins, uh, management check-ins. And we we're already working like that. When COVID hit, it was, a, it was just, it was, it was actually a blessing from the sales side because we no longer had to go to the customer and customers <laughs> were forced to take the, the calls on Zoom. And we're like, awesome, we don't have to spend now on, on travel and accommodations and stuff. This was taking a toll on us. Yeah. And Every, everybody's the same in a little, little block box, right? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was awesome. It was awesome because before, before COVID, it was like trying to get a Zoom call or something. It was like, no, we have to fly in. Let's go to Myanmar. Let's make a dinner. Let's get it going. And I, I spent the whole week going to a country. Maybe a deal comes out. Nothing comes out. After COVID, it's like, okay, well, you know what? Click it in. Zoom. Okay, here you are. And you're closing a deal on Zoom without even meeting the person. The trick goes back to the people that you're hiring and, and, and make sure that the people that you're hiring have the mentality that they're going to wrap up their, their, their sleeves and that it, they will do whatever it takes. We have, for example, one of the hardest things we have right now is um, weekly check-ins at night and then everybody has to move because we are in time zones where there is 13, 12 hours difference. So we have our guys in Latin America, in Argentina, in Colombia, in Mexico, uh, on a time zone that when you compare it to Singapore, India, Bangladesh, you're sitting, somebody's gonna have to wake up at five o'clock. And then waking up at five o'clock is not fun if you have to do it all the time. And then you have to start balancing it. But you just have to be able to say, hey, okay, fine, I'm, I'm willing to do it. Maybe the next time we do it. And, and from that perspective, ensure that you have, I've been lucky enough to have team members, co-founder that are actually very process oriented. So they've implemented a lot of the processes. They made sure that we have um, the, the tools in place, the slacks, the, the, the drop-ins. They created now a drop-in that you just basically have a link and if you have nothing else to do, you just go take a coffee and drop in with somebody. We're, and, and, and mind it, we're only 35 plus or 30, 30 plus uh, employees. So it's not like we've got them there, but it's, it's interesting. Yeah, well, I, I took one for the team for this uh, for this panel because it was fireside chat because it's you know it's one fifty p.m. for you and it's one fifty a.m. for me right now. Yeah. So uh, uh, yeah, I'm on the uh, U.S. East Coast. Um, uh, hope I, I, I'm going to China tomorrow, but um, I uh, just got two shots today, or two, two COVID tests, and I, apparently I got them from the wrong vendor. So I'm gonna I'm gonna be uh, stuck in San Francisco for a while. I'm like. It's going to be like a week long journey to try and get into China. Hopefully it doesn't take longer. So, um, uh, so, I mean, we could go on for probably forever. Um, does anybody have any questions? I'm not sure how we take questions, but, uh, Drew, if you could like help people uh, take questions. I mean, um, I can, I can start grilling, uh, Taro about, uh, you know, his, uh, many, many faults and mistakes as a, as a, uh, as a manager, that, that it could be lots of fun. But uh, anybody have any questions? Um, so uh, while they're thinking about it, um, I'd say like uh, one of the um, like one of the, the 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 biggest problems that the companies that we work with struggle with is like which market do you choose, right? Because it's almost like um, you know you have the you know, the selection, and it's like oh, you know, it's like going, you know there's a pizzas, uh, lots of pizzas. You want you know, peppers, you want pepperoni, you want the vegan one, you want the sausage and onions. It's like, like all these choices. And just imagine that you've never eaten any of these things. It's just like different colors, right? And all you see is different colors. Um, so uh, how, um, you know, what, what are the best tips or, or approaches uh, in terms of market selection? Or, or is it just like, hey, I'm going to partner with people and whoever partners with me, I go to that market. Um, so what, what, what's your, uh, what's your approach? That, that actually could be one way. I mean, I mean, it, it all depends <laughs> on where you are. And, and if you ask me, it, it all depends where you are. If you, if you're sitting with an idea and you're saying, okay, where am I going to launch it? Well, just, just make sure that, that where you're going to launch it, you can live and you know the country and you know, the lo you're a little bit local and understand what's going on. It's like, it's like, if I wanted to launch, when I yeah. launched an agri-tech service in, in Myanmar, I mean, the fact that there is eight days in Myanmar is outrageous. No one understands what are the eight days in a week. And see, you're also asking yourself, how the hell is it eight days? And how does a farmer understand eight days? And then secondary, people, uh, farmers don't understand uh, week, weeks as in Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. They have animals on it. 
And lastly, when you ask when you ask a farmer, you say, "Do you know what internet is?" And say, they say, "No, we have no clue." They, you don't use internet? No, we don't. Okay, so do you use Facebook? And they say, "Yeah, yeah, we use Facebook every day." And and just that fact is is just to tell you, hey, if you're gonna launch something, well, you better know the country where you're gonna do it. If you don't, make sure that you learn the country. Now, if yeah. if you're sitting around the around and you already have a product or you have something kind of like going, and I would I would say that you choose the country based on a little bit opportunistically. If if you're starting and you don't you don't have like traction on, on any country, but you want to have something, choose it where you're gonna get it the fastest. If you have traction, then decide okay, why is it that really you have to go into China? Why is it that you have to go into Indonesia? Why do you have to go into Vietnam? Make a choice and then execute on that choice. But um, if 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 you're sitting if you're sitting like, hey, you know what, we don't have the traction, but we almost have the traction, but you know, I would say, I would say my learning is go where you're gonna be more opportunistic, be more successful. And if you if you have the right context in a country, or if you have the right partner, if you, if you have the right team, or you're living in that, we'll just make a POC in that country and then take it from there. I think that that's opportunistically, that's how okay. we go on. <laughs> so yeah, so I mean, uh, we, we partner with you, and basically what we do is we just throw you into the various markets, and then see whether you stick. Yeah. Um, True. And uh, but I think um, you know it's a, a little bit more intentional than that because um, um, you know your what you were selling like, changed significantly over time, right? Uh, and uh, and you know. Was that because you came up with a light bulb one day? Is like we should do this amazing new thing, or was it? Was it? Uh, was it more like an iterative process? I think I think market was asking. We were not listening. It took us a while to listen. We got hooked into revenues, uh, and and once you you once you play the game with the VCs, i.e. you, and then you see the graph going this way, and those revenues depend on a business which you want to kill. It's very difficult to go back and say, oh, I want to kill that business and then replace it overnight. And so, so we we were not listening to the market, and the market at some point was telling us, "Hey, we want mm -hmm. tournaments, we want tournaments, we want leaderboards, we want to, we want challenges, we want prices." And the moment we started listening, and the moment we decided to walk away from or try to understand how to create our own IP, we started doing that, and we luckily stumbled upon it. And, and overnight, I think our sales guy uh, Calvin, he did a fantastic deck that we went and sold it to the first customer, and the first customer said, "Okay, I'm in," thinking that we had. Who knows how many customers were out, <laughs> and we just sold it, and then we had to deliver it, and from the delivery, we just had to scale it, and and luckily enough, I think that that was the second life of our startup. So we we were a startup within a startup, uh, and we just grew a new product overnight. So I think that that was the stuff. awesome. So you got like one minute left. Uh, any last parting words? Uh, I mean, I, I, I've been uh, pushing pretty hard here, uh, but uh, anything that you want to comment on? No, I think it's, it's been fun. It's been fun ride with you, William, and, and joining Latin America, Southeast Asia, sitting in Singapore, doing these night owls and, and, and trying yeah. to understand all these languages across has been, has been fun for all the, the audience. The craziest out there. thing is finding out like uh, that after uh, we started working together, I, we actually went to high school together. No, I think actually people don't believe me that. Uh, I, I, just for the record here, since it's being recorded, and I closed the deal investment with William, and I was very formal at the beginning. It's like, oh, Mr. William, can you please give me a, give me a meeting? <laughs> and that was a Saturday, and I, I decided to look where he had gone to high school, and all of a sudden- we oh, LinkedIn. Up. It's on LinkedIn for me. I know. I, you. I, I, that. I didn't do my KYC correctly, and then we found out that William was sophomore. I was a freshman at Blair, and I'm like, what the hell? How many Blairs are there? And then- so, so the next question was, okay, let me watch this up and say, hey, I need to talk to you. I, th I think he thought I was going to pull out a deal the next day, but basically yeah, it was like good stuff. Awesome. Well, um, you know, uh, the relationships can go a lot of ways, and, and uh, it's always good to have multiple ways to connect. Uh, that's what's very important when you're going cross-border into multiple markets. You know, market by market by market, uh, and uh, and you're going to take your team along with you. So. Um, it, it's not the easiest thing to do. Um, get mentors, talk to people who have been there, done there, and uh, you know, uh, reach out to us. Uh, always happy to help. Uh, Chris, I'm going to kick it back to you. All right. Thank you so much, guys. Nice work. A round of applause for you from all the way down here in New Orleans, Louisiana. 
in the United States. I'm even earlier than you, William, um, or later, I should say. Well, I'm in Miami. I think I'm south of you. <laughs> yes, that's true. Barely. You're barely <laughs> south. But great job, guys. Enjoy your trip, William, and everyone watching. Thank you so much for being a part of the event. Our next session starts in about 10 minutes, so we will see you there. Thank you, Taro and William. See you guys later. Thank you, Chris. Thanks. Thank you, William. Thanks, everybody. See you around. Cheers. Bye.